And we're going. All right. Um, Hi. Hi, I'm Gory First. I sent out some WebEx invites. Glad that so many people managed to find this meeting. David, introduce yourself. Um, I'm David Black, uh, one of the uh, co-chairs of this Three Ring Circus, better known as the Transport, the Transport Area Working Group. <laughs> And I'm Wes Eddy, I'm the third co-chair of this working group. So I guess for this particular meeting, um, Wes is going to be the main co-chair. And try and um, lead us through the, the course ahead and figure out what to do. So Wes, are you just going to go through the chair slides? Or do you want me to do that? We have to start with uh, the note well as usual so uh the standard itf note well about the uh way that we do intellectual property and some instructions on uh participating in this webex interim uh pad for blue sheets so uh people are supposed to head over to the etherpad link from the itf uh web page and record your name and organization there. Uh, Jabber is up for remote chat. And uh, there are then some further instructions on how to use the WebEx chat. So um, the goal is to use the WebEx chat for queue management. So people who want to speak, we're asking you to send a plus queue into the WebEx chat and we'll be watching that so that then we can uh, call on you when it's time to speak. That way we don't have people standing on one another since there's no uh, mics to line up at physically. And if you're not speaking, uh, we're asking people to be on mute, please. If somebody makes your point for you, um, please, send, please send minus Q. In addition, uh, we working group chairs will try to be very good about joining the queue with plus Q when we have remarks to make as individuals, so as to avoid taking un un undue advantage of our law of, of our positions. I think we've front loaded uh, the work from this side of finding a taker. Thank you, Nick. And, uh, I guess uh, this is kind of a focused meeting, so the note on submitting drafts isn't as important, but for anyone that uh, doesn't know, if you're submitting any drafts, add TSVWG to the ID title. Please go on mute if you're not speaking, and doing it at WebEx will protect the meeting from interesting things on your links. So there are some uh, relevant working group milestones for the L4S documents. And uh, also we mentioned the uh, non-building PHP document here, uh, all of which are adopted working group items that we've been trying to progress. And this uh, discussion about what to do with ECT1 is uh, something we need to get resolved before we do that. This is interim number two, and this is a quick overview of the agenda. So we're already doing the uh, chairs update, and uh, we have one set of charts. And the idea uh, that is to go through that twice, actually. So we have a quick run through, so everyone gets a sense of uh, what's what's there to be talked about, and then we want to do a slow walkthrough where uh, people have a chance to discuss each sort of uh, question and, and point. And um, an analogy is like uh, when you go to the buffet, looking at what all is there before you decide what to put on the plate. So uh, we want to try to avoid having discussions where we're referring to uh, things we haven't got to yet in the conversation. Uh, uh, that's the goal of doing a quick run through first. And then hopefully we'll be able to synthesize some kind of summary of what the result of the meeting is by the end. Right. 
So just to recap, please add your name to the blue sheets because uh, I see we have 87 people on the WebEx and uh, hopefully we have 87 names on the blue sheets. And uh, yeah, please use plus Q if you want to talk in the Jabber Q. So, slide decks here. Am I sharing the ECT1 slide deck now? The game plan for this deck is the chairs are going to go through it. Um, the first approximation, Wes is going to handle all of the um, working group stuff. Um, Gory, will, Gory and I will, will we try and do Socratic dialogues when we get to slides that contain uh, blue material for L4S and gold material for SCE. With the exception, I think there's one slide for each of them, which is entirely blue or entirely gold, which will turn over to the team, the uh, uh, individual uh, uh, teams, groups, whatever you want, 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 want to call them, uh, to, uh, to present. Ready, ready, ready to go with this one? Okay, maybe I need to say one thing before we start, um, which is, uh, I, I'm Gory still. Uh, when we put this slide deck together, uh, we had a process where we circulated the slide deck with the chair's contributions and some blank slides to each of the proponents of the two sets of internet drafts. And they revised them, they sent them back to the chairs, the chairs uh, moderated, thought, uh, reconstructed the slides and distributed the, these again. And this went through several phases until we ran this particular slide deck. So the words in the blue boxes don't come from the chairs, and the words in the orange goldy boxes don't come from the chairs. But together they represent a picture of where we are, which we'll try, now try and guide you through. This is not a perfect slide deck. It's the one we could put together that appears to be sufficient to organize this meeting. Please bear with us. It's been an interesting journey and we're not done yet. Uh, Martin. Clarifying question. So the, the, the question at hand is the nature of the ECD1 code point, which is detached from the uh, choice of L4S or SCE. Let's go, walk through, let's go walk through a few slides and then come back to that to make sure we are clear on uh, what, what, what is being asked for the working group. Okay. Wes? Okay, I'm going to go. Whoops. These are not flipping in the order I expected. All right. <laughs> See if you can get to two. There we go. There we go. Okay. So the key goal. And uh, for this meeting, uh, the most important thing, I think, is uh, figuring out what the working group wants to do uh, here and now in 2020. So um, a number of years ago, uh, actually, when the sort of at the tail end of the AQM working group, uh, as that was in the process of closing, uh, there was um, L4S proposal came to the IETF. And there was uh, actually an L4S BOF, and uh, then eventually um, L4S was adopted in the TSVWG, and that was um, around a problem statement and set of goals uh, working towards ultra low latency, low loss, and scalable uh, congestion controls in the internet. And um, you know, one of the, the key L4S design. Uh, pieces is uh, without requiring the network to do transport layer inspection or perf queuing and scheduling. Uh, we think that now, uh, as we've seen the SCE proposal, there's one uh, big similarity, which is both of them are aimed at providing uh, scalable um, reduced uh, size of sawtooth kinds of congestion control algorithms. Uh, SCE is very focused on uh, providing the high fidelity feedback uh, from the network needed to do that. And uh, essentially just that, L4S is also uh, attempting to provide 
low latency, uh, low loss for those flows. Uh, we think those are the key differences in goals between the two proposals. And when we come back through here in the second round, I guess we'll be looking for feedback from the rest of the working group about what they're interested in uh, in 2020. Right. This is David. The thing to emphasize on this slide is that the two proposals are going after different problems with different goals. First paragraph in each column is indicative of what that particular proposal uh, intends to do. Thank you. So the reason why we have to talk about this at great length is because uh, both technologies have a way of using ECT1 that uh, is different, and uh, particularly both of them are are um, different from uh, sort of classic ECM. So um, RFC forty seven seventy four already uh, describes that you can use alternate ECM semantics, but uh, it describes that to do so you use a, a DSCP in order to uh, signal the alternate semantics uh, for the obvious reasons that DSCP isn't working well across the public internet. I think both of these proposals would rather use ECT1 without uh, the DSCP scoping. So uh, the, the key that I think we have uh, pulled out is that uh, L would like to use ECT1 as an input to uh, how the network treats packets, and SCE would like to use ECT1 as an output uh, to indicate uh, how the network has uh, treated a packet. So um, since these are obviously not compatible at internet scope, we can only have one of these things, and uh, the goal of the meeting today is to figure out whether an input or an output is a more sensible thing to do. And there have been uh, actually some great uh, positions that people have been posting to the mailing list in the last few days, uh, outlining exactly why they think one way or the other. Maybe we can talk about those when we come back through the chart deck. Uh, for people who haven't been, sorry, David, do you wanna say something? Still on mute. So for, for people who haven't been paying attention, uh, uh, this is a quick and uh, I guess not very accurate, but a uh, decent way to think about um, uh, input versus the output uh, behaviors differ. So. Uh, on the left, for traffic that's not ECN capable, the only thing the network can do is drop it, which results in large saw teeth and uh, is sort of the current status quo for congestion control without ECN that we want to improve on. Uh, with a traditional ECN capable transport using ECT0, the network can keep dropping or it can uh, add CE marks. So the CE marks currently still result in those coarse salt teeth. Uh, L4S provides the uh, capability to treat the CE marks as a finer grained congestion. Control. And it does that if the input packets use ECT1 uh, so that they're basically identifying themselves as a different type of ECN capable transport. Uh, SCE, in contrast, still uses ECT0 to indicate an ECN capable transport, but then uh, in addition to dropping and using CE marks consistent with uh, RFC 3168, it adds the ability to switch an ECT0 mark to an ECT1 mark 
to uh, provide that fine grain congestion control signal uh, to uh, flows that understand it. So this is kind of a, a very brief and the details are missing overview, but uh, it, it shows you how ECT1 is being used differently by the two technologies. This is Stuart, can you guys hear me? wanted to make one comment here to, to reiterate what's being said here. When I was wrestling in my head about these two proposals, because SCE came along later, but I wanted to give it a fair evaluation. I didn't want to be one of those people who just reje rejects the new thing because we're already on a path. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I think for me, the light bulb moment that helped me make the comparison is that we only have one code point left to use. And L4S is using that as an input code point to the network so that we can have two flavors of traffic flowing into the network that gives the network a hint how to handle those flavors of traffic. With SCE, that code point is being used as an output code point. So all traffic coming into the network looks the same. It can't make any declarations about what type of traffic it is. But on the output side, we have more fidelity to indicate small congestion versus big congestion. And I think that input versus output was what helped me wrap my head around it. And that, that's the key decision we're going to be trying to make today, which is whether to use that one code point, which, which I wish I could split in half but can't, as input to the network, um, as shown in the, the blue L4S box, or output from the network shown in the gold SCE box. Okay, and now we have uh, a chance where I think we want Bob to talk about L4S uh, for a bit, and then we'll go to a slide where I think Jonathan will talk about SCE for a bit. I, I think this Greg is going to go through this slide. Okay, Greg is good too. Greg, can, uh, let let's keep this to five to, to let's keep this to five minutes apiece. Five minutes uh, here, and then SCE five minutes five minutes on the next slide. Okay, um, so this is intended as the quick walkthrough. I take it. Um, so this, the slide starts off indicating um, you know the key point in this. Uh, discussion around um, uh, the presence of tunneling and uh, encapsulations on the internet. Um, more than 50% of all internet traffic by at least some metrics is encrypted and or tunneled. Um, and the key differentiators and uh, reasons why ECT1 as an input makes sense uh, are right in the bullet list uh, at the top. Um, First off, it doesn't require access to transport headers um, because there's an explicit signal within IP header with this ECT1 value. Uh, the network can then treat uh, uh, flows that support this new um, congestion signaling um, solely by looking at uh, that, that IP header. Uh, secondly, uh, it can be supported by network bottlenecks that implement multiple uh, types of uh, um, AQM disciplines, um, in particular, FQ or uh, flow queuing is a uh, is one mechanism by which um, L4S can be supported, and also a simpler dual queue scheme uh, can also be be supported solely by again utilizing that that ECT1 value as uh, an input to the network. Supported by existing tunnels and encapsulations, there's been again a fair amount of discussion on that on the mailing list. Revolves um, around how uh, exactly the ECN field is treated um, as uh, players are uh, decapsulated from uh, a tunnel, and whether signals that were applied uh, along the path uh, are propagated. Uh, to the, to the inner packet as it's uh, uh, decapsulated. Um, and here, uh, existing implementations, um, the uh, the L4S mechanism, ECT1 as input, uh, is supported. Um, 
it works in the presence of TCP ACK thinning. Um, so uh, the, the feedback mechanism um, with accurate ECN uh, is, is feeding back a single signal um, of congestion is uh, CE mark, and that is robust to uh, um, ACK thinning. Yeah. It's compatible with existing data center network deployments. Um, it aligns with uh, the DC TCP uh, mechanisms used in data centers and a lot of data centers currently. Finally, it eventually frees up ECT0. Um, if you um, take a look back at the, the previous slide with the graphic, see that uh, uh, in the blue box, ECT0 doesn't appear. So a bottleneck can continue to support RFC 3168 and RFC 8311 along with L4S, and so it can support um, compatibility with any existing deployments of 3168 that use ECT0 as an input, but it doesn't um, uh, need to uh, long term. So the network could, um, the ITF uh, could reclaim ECT0 for another purpose at some point in the future. For all of those uh, points, the ECT1 as an output, so the SE proposal um, uh, doesn't uh, achieve those, uh, those attributes. And further, due to its reliance on Q uh, and uh, inspecting headers, I think layer four headers, um, it would essentially require all bottlenecks that want to support this uh, new congestion signaling to implement uh, something that inspects L4 headers um, uh, and, and perhaps the scheduling of, you know, per flow scheduling. There are a number of, well, because the um, L4S drafts are all uh, transport area working group adopted drafts, the chairs created a issues, a set of issues, the issues tracker in order to help us manage the discussion. Um, and there are a number of open issues that were created there. Um, all of those have been addressed. I think there may be some that um, they're still listed as open, but they've there's been a fair amount of discussion on all of them. Many of them are not closed. Um, the key ones here, um, there were some concerns early on about IP for us and the dual queue coupled AQM draft those uh, have all been resolved on uh, the side issue is closed. Uh, safe coexistence and RFC 3168 ECN bottleneck. So this has been uh, a fair amount of the um, uh, discussion on the mailings has been around the potential presence of these uh, classic ECN bottlenecks on the network and uh, what happens when L4S traffic um, transits through one of those bottlenecks if they exist. Um, there's been a fair amount of work on coming up with ways to, to mitigate that and there's more discussion on that. Um, RTT dependence was another issue that's been addressed recently. Uh, and the CE ambiguity and reordering, uh, another issue that um, I think is closed. Um, looks like I'm running short on time for the five minutes here, but uh, there's been a tremendous amount of demonstration of the L4S mechanism, both in simulation and in testbed implementations. Uh, Bob and Assad um, posted uh, thousands of um, testbed results um, it, it, just in the, the past few days, and there had been thousands done prior to that. Um, uh, final statements here, um, so if L4S is standardized, um, the consistent ultra low latency for all applications, including web, in streaming, cloud VR, AR, and high fidelity interactive media, can be rapidly supported. This is uh, easily deployed on a lot of um, bottleneck links um, via this dual queue scheme. Um, and so it can be adopted very quickly. Um, the the goals and the benefits of the approach 
lend themselves to uh, incentivizing applications to make the switch to using an L4S compatible congestion controller. It's not seen as a special class of traffic or a, a type of traffic for certain use cases and, and not for others. It's intended for all traffic to allow all applications to get uh, significantly lower latency, low loss, and scalable throughput. And for all those factors, um, we've seen a, a large uh, support across the industry, a lot of operators as well as network equipment manufacturers and end system developers are supporting it. Okay, thank you, Greg. I time it about eight minutes. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, whoever's speaking for SC, is that Rod, Jonathan, Pete? I think that would be me, that's Jonathan. Okay, so first um, addressing one or two, briefly addressing one or two things from the previous slide. Um, I don't think that there is consensus that the, that, that uh, some of these open issues have been closed. Uh, Jonathan, I, I can say I would agree with you on the fallback one. I don't. I wouldn't say that's closed yet. I'd also caution on the use of the word consensus, please. Let's let's stick with agreement for the time being. Okay. So moving on. So SE signaling method and control loop are very simple, and they're designed to be robust. Um, the implementations can be done quite quickly. And we specifically designed them to ensure RSC 3168 compatibility uh, in all circumstances. So whenever we see a CE mark, we respond in the same way as a conventional PCP transport. So the on white mile protocol is also minimal. We use one ECN code point, one TCP header flag. These are statusly interpretable and everything else is left alone. Um, we think hardware implementation of the AQMs is feasible, uh, even though they implement um, fair queuing or approximate fairness as part of the argument. And the big thing that we offer here is unambiguous signaling on the output because we have separate code points for a big reduction with CE and a small reduction with SCE, uh, where we're using ECT1 to signal SCE, some congestion experienced. Now, in that scheme, the congestion experience code point acts as a safety valve in case the uh, SCE signal is not present or has been erased by something. And also for large capacity reductions in which a series of small reductions might take too long. Now, because we have a safe decoupled system design, uh, which doesn't mandate any particular algorithm to be implemented either at the AQM or at endpoints, we permit fewer, we have, we can permit future innovation in the algorithm space, both for the AQM and the congestion control. Uh, and indeed in the transport space. We have working examples, running code, public reference implementation, and this includes a simple one over P congestion control scheme, which is broadly derived from DC TCP, but using the SCE signaling scheme. So, um, there are some open challenges with respect to uh, tunnels and fragment reassembly. And I've, um, a few minutes ago, I posted a to the list with a summary of that position as well. And we can discuss that later. Um, I think that's all I need to say here. more time if there's anything else you can you uh you can think of otherwise the chairs greatly appreciate you yielding back the balance of your time <laughs> i 
I'll take silence as gold and let's move on. Okay. So we have a chart to drill a little bit further into the ECT uh, one as an input versus as an output usage. Uh, L4S is using it as an input in order to isolate the traffic that uh, only creates low latency from the classic traffic that will fill up the queue. And, uh, and, and so uh, it differs from SCE where uh, ECT1 is now a output from the network to uh, indicate a different uh, level of congestion. And I think for our quick overview uh, of this slide deck, there's not much else to say on this one. Can I, can I just, um, yeah. I just noticed that the last bullet I had pointed out to Gory that it's been broken. There's not all the text is there. Yeah, we have I can... a uh, subject, but no predicate. On, on the blue side, I'll, I'll see if I can yeah. dig out what the slide was meant to say. Actually, it's some kind of PDF conversion thing, because I think on the prior uh, copy I also have, uh, what that bullet is saying is that IPsec encapsulations uh, strip off the ECT1 markings. With that clarification, let's move on. So whatever we do, it has to friendly, uh, or has to exist in a friendly way with uh, competing traffic and specifically uh, congestion controls that are in use on the internet today. That includes Reno and Cubic, and it also includes uh, classic ECM. Um, so we have discussed a lot on the mailing list, and I think there's no longer really concerns about uh, uh, FQ being a significant cause of some kind of coexistence problems in the network. Uh, but we do still have um, uh, work ongoing uh, for L4S classic uh, bottleneck detection in order to figure out if there's a traditional uh, use of um, CE marks in the network and uh, make sure that an L4S using flow uh, backs off appropriately so that uh, it's friendly to other competing traffic. Um, we haven't tried to mathematically define what starvation means. But uh, we think it's one of those, we know it when we see it kinds of things. And uh, the most I think we were comfortable saying was that starvation of any class of traffic is not an acceptable outcome. Drilling into that a little bit more, uh, both the L4S and the SCE proponents have prepared the material uh, on this chart and the tables that uh, show their behavior when there are different types of bottlenecks in the network. And um, you know, at a uh, high level, I think it's interesting that both tables are very, very similar. There's only a one cell difference. Uh, so I think we can maybe just move on in this fast run and then come back to the second pass. Almost certainly come back to the second pass. Those tables, those tables are expected to be controversial. Please, everybody, keep in mind, you're looking at tables that were prepared from one viewpoint. So it's not that either of these is intended to be a dispassionate uh, representation of facts. This is what each of the uh, proposals does as expressed by the proponents of the proposal. Okay, moving on. Thank you. Okay, so um, these things are uh, targeted to be experimentally deployed across the internet. And uh, because of that, there are a bunch of questions about how well they will work. 
Uh, how will an operator know if their uh, network is being crossed by this traffic and if they should be concerned with that? Uh, there has been a lot of good discussion on the mailing list about uh, how these things work with tunnel or with various lower layers. And um, we also need to uh, figure out how to reclassify in a domain that's not part of the experiment. So uh, if traffic leaks. So um, here are the summaries from each team on how ECT1 uh, propagates through the internet in the way that they uh, each respectively use it. Um, so uh, I'm not sure anything here needs to be highlighted in our quick overview. Um, oh, someone, Bob, is on the queue. Okay. Yeah, I just, just, just again, I wanted to say that there used to be a question at the top there, which said something about um, ECN tunnels and and fragmentation. I think it's just a blank space now. Where at the top above the two, just just for people who haven't seen these slides before, they won't won't know the context. Yeah. And at some point, if uh, successful or not, these experiments come to an end. And so this is some advanced thinking about what an end state looks like, either success or failure for each one. So uh, as Greg explained already in the L4S success scenario, ECT0 could actually be reclaimed. Um, in the uh, case where L4S uh, is not successful, then um, the ECT1 uh, could be blocked by the network and in the long term reclaimed. Uh, SC uh, likewise has uh, some, some thoughts on uh, success. So in the success scenario, uh, both the ECT0 and one code points will be used. They're both valid outputs that mean different things. Um, in terms of undeployment, um, since SCE uh, queues are only uh, changing a ECT0 to a ECT1 or a CE, uh, they're easy to detect when they're uh, doing the ECT1 uh, transition. And so the idea is that uh, people can find them and eliminate them. Um, and then eventually ECT1 can be reclaimed uh, when those SCE are out of the network. And then uh, we asked each of the groups to put together a quick summary of uh, who plans to deploy and use their technologies. So, um, Greg or Bob, do you want to speak to the L4S uh, deployment plans here? This is Greg. I, I can comment on this. So, um, this list, uh, um, and I, I would invite any of these. Uh, 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 participants who represent these companies to make a statement if they, cho if they choose to. Um, but the list on the uh, left hand side are companies that indicated that they do have plans to deploy L4S. Um, the uh, uh, top part of the list includes end system companies as well as network equipment uh, manufacturers uh, and, and uh, lower half or lower part of the list includes uh, network operators, uh, many of whom are uh, cable network operators, I think, as most folks are aware. Um, uh, the DOCSIS protocol has been uh, amended uh, in, in the DOCSIS 3.1 version to include support for L4S, and that's a mandatory feature for DOCSIS 3.1 equipment. Um, it's, a, it's a software upgrade on existing equipment that is in the field providing broadband service to uh, millions of, of customers uh, worldwide, millions of, of, um, of users. <clears throat> um, so there are uh, 
a large number of um, network operators that will be able to deploy L4S very rapidly um, and um, uh, this is a short list of the ones that have explicitly uh, asked to be listed as, um, as planning to deploy. But uh, as the technology gets rolled out in equipment, um, there will be um, presumably far more. On the, on the right hand side, um, there's some additional statements of support from no, a number of companies um, who, uh, um, who are following this space and, uh, and evaluating uh, how they would support it in their equipment. And then finally, um, there's a proposal within 3GPP to adopt uh, a support for L4S. And there were a number of companies who signed on to that proposal, either directly to the contribution in 3GPP or, uh, or at the meetings where it was discussed. Okay, our time that is about two and a half minutes. Let's go to the next slide, then pick up Jake out of the queue. Two and a half minutes, Jonathan. Okay, so we've had um, specific interest in SCE from two major companies who have actually contributed to our research in some way. And this includes HP Enterprise who uh, helped us with some experiments in the data center space um, last year. And um, we've had some um we've had some i think stuart cheshire won't mind me mentioning me mentioning him here at this uh <clears throat> but th the main deployment scenario is in customer pessimistic equipment um initially uh, particularly in the open source variants that use that are based on open route and so on so uh, I happen to be the author of um, a QDisk that's already widely deployed there, and it would be relatively straightforward to add support to SCE to existing deployments of that, as well as to the Wi-Fi stack in Linux, which now supports uh, a version of FQ Codel. So we have a good working relationship with the relevant parties here. So we also believe that high fidelity congestion control is um, just as attractive if it's implemented using SCE as if it was implemented using L4S. So we think that a good deal of the support expressed by L4S uh, in their previous slide would come along um, if the decision goes our way. Since uh, the L4S um, implementation can, for the most part, be converted to use SCE signaling. Okay, finished. Um, uh, this is Stuart. Um, since why my name was mentioned, let me just add a couple of words of clarification. Jonathan and I have talked at some length. Uh, previous ITF meetings. I have reviewed the drafts and given Jonathan feedback on that. I'm very appreciative that uh, Jonathan has brought these drafts forward to discuss these ideas because whatever decision TSV WG makes in the end, we will make that decision having considered all the possibilities and that makes the final outcome stronger. I want to clarify what's on this slide. What I expressed as an Apple representative is kind of what's captured here. We have interest in high fidelity congestion control being technology neutral is also motherhood and Apple pie when it comes to networking and anything that can lower end to end delay and jitter is really important for better user experience on the internet. So 100% support for that. However, the heading of this slide is who plans to deploy SCE. And that is an enormous leap 
from Apple would like low latency on the internet, check to Apple plans to deploy SCE. And um, sorry to be harsh, but uh, I need to correct the record here that Apple has no plan to deploy SCE. And I'm sorry, Jonathan, if anything I said gave you that impression. Thank you for the clarification, Stuart. Next slide. Uh, uh, David, I was in the queue. You said uh, you wanted to come to me. Okay, Rod. Let, 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 let's take that uh, pretty quickly, though, because we're going to we're going to have we're going to go through a second time with massive discussion. My bad. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, I likewise wanted to say something similar to Stuart. Uh, I would uh, refer to both slides. Akamai has appeared on both of these, and uh, I mean. Plan to deploy is a little bit strong for what we have. What we ha what we, I, I would characterize our position as we are interested in a solution to latency on the internet. Uh, we think that this is good and interesting work. Whatever everybody else does, we almost certainly will participate and try to solve the uh, the uh, latency problem on the internet by deploying the appropriate technology on our side. Uh, you know, we encourage the working group to carefully consider and come to the right conclusion. Um, we are likewise approximately technology neutral outside of the specific technical considerations that we uh, that we have. We endorse a particular uh, side of this debate. Exactly. Uh, thank you. And Rod, and brief clarification only, please. Rod, can't hear you. You are on mute. Maybe we can come back to Rod's comment when we do the second pass through here. Okay. So uh, this is the last and final slide uh, that I'll stumble through before we go back to the beginning and do the slow uh, roll through for discussion, but um we want to talk about what happens if no decision can be made by the working group uh in that case we would uh not be able to um progress the l4s identifier draft without making some changes to it uh and uh, sce would also not really be able to work by itself uh without you know scoping it to a dscp uh, so RFC 4774, which talks about that DSCP scoping would uh, become the relevant uh, thing to go to in this scenario where we can't make a decision about uh, working group consensus on how to use ECT1. So uh, is that clarified? Uh, oh, I see Dave Tott is in the queue. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. I like your screen name. Well, it's not unintentional. I put that in years ago. I don't know how to change it. Uh, <laughs> so if no decision, I would like to stress that the character of the testing to date is focused on one and two flow tests only. Mostly running on the stuff that is in congestion avoidance mode rather than in which I believe the majority of internet traffic is in slow start. It also has not tested asymmetric networks very common in CPE. For one example, gigabit uh, uh, Comcast current gigabit service is one gigabit down 35 megabits up. And it's components of the uh, L4S architecture, which include ACK, ECN. I would really like com comprehensive tests of asymmetric networks overall to be performed for both stuff before we even get RFC test. 
I think this is headed into discussion as opposed to a clarification question. So we probably probably need probably need to come back to it. My overall point being more testing is needed before any decision making can be made. Thank you. Donna. Clarification for now, please. We're about to open up for discussion and go back to back to back to the top of the deck. Uh, well, I'll get my take myself out of the queue. I was busy. I thought you were opening it up for discussion. If not, I can just uh, hang around and be in the queue. Okay, hang around. Um, Spencer, this slide or top of, or 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 top of the deck. Um, actually, the previous slide. I was I was trying to decide whether to say anything on it. The the yeah the the who plans to deploy and actually uh, the one before that. I'm sorry. Um, so um, the the support in three GPP is something that I had been talking with three GPP people about several years ago. Um, do do you all have a sense of how uh, how firm that is on current plans for them? Because one of the one, you know, one of the things with three GPP is that things that aren't ready get dropped out of releases. Um, and this was a conversation that I was having with the three uh, GPP liaison to the IETF in a TSB uh, working group meeting probably three years ago. I don't think it was four, but it was more than two. Uh, so I, I just wondered if anybody had a uh, liveness check on that on that uh, idea of support. Do we have anyone on the call with 3GPP affiliation who is brave enough to try to speak for 3GPP? Uh, this is Kevin Smith of Vodafone. I maybe can't speak for 3GPP, but I can speak for Vodafone. That along with Ericsson, we've uh, put through a, a proposal to enable support of L4S uh, via the RAN group, and it's gone into the SA group, the architecture group accordingly. So it's a live change requests from our perspective and something we strongly support. So I, I guess the other thing to mention is there's a uh, 3GPP IETF coordination call tomorrow uh, that this might be a good topic for somebody to bring up, uh, probably from the IETF side, because uh, I know that um, uh, liaison uh, discussions are uh, on the, on the uh, agenda for that. Thank you. Yes, be... sorry here. Yeah, um, we, we noted that, and we've we've tried to make contact with Lionel just to say we should add that to the agenda. Excellent. And Thank we, you. We will bring that up. Um, response to Dave's comment: We'd love to join the call. So, uh, so, so, so would a cast of thousands. It's a, it's, it, it's more of a process leadership coordination call. Um, we're not. It's, 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 it's not a smoke filled room or star chamber. Okay, Per Vilas here from Ericsson. May I make a comment? Go ahead. Yeah, we're, so. We're uh, still trying to do clarification, but yes, go ahead. And then, then we'll go back to the top of the discussion. Was a it was a clarification about this uh, 3GPP, uh, since I'm working with 5G RON architecture. Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify that, that this L4S is uh, working uh, as as is with the model 3D has uh, for the different bearers, uh, and uh, and this ECT marking taking as a as an input can map to the to the bearers. And what has been discussed is in particular in this 5D run where you have made uh, a split of the base station. So that is an option in the uh, 5G. Uh, deployment to split the base station and for that internal interface uh, there has been a discussion how uh, do we in an optimal way uh, convey l4s and that discussion has been postponed for for a future release uh, it does not mean that you cannot deploy l4s on a 3 gpp network that can be done uh, today assuming we implement the support of course okay thank you Wes, I think we need to go back to the top of the deck and throw the floor open for open for discussion. Um, yeah. can, I, can I just make a procedural thing here? Can we try and make sure that we're using the WebEx chat?
to talk about um, facts and not to um, try and um, distract people from the main conversation. Your WebEx chat is not going to wind up in meeting minutes, among other things. Okay, back to the top of the slide deck, please. Yeah. I think we're there, and I think we have Gina and Stuart in the queue. Hi, Jana Iyengar. I'm surprised there are only two of us in the queue. Um, um, Just wait. Oh, it's too early. Um, so thank you for laying out all the the the, the premise and sort of the the things. It's, it's really helpful. The chairs did the summary, uh, and I think it's very well done. So thank you for doing that. There's one point that didn't come through, and I want to emphasize on that. And that is perhaps the the most important thing for me when I'm uh, looking at these proposals. Um, if we want to have low latency uh, traffic, low, a, low lat a solution for low latency networking here at all, we need to have multiple queues in the network. This is not in question in my mind. Um, you cannot get away from this. And you have to have a queue for legacy and you have to have a queue for low latency. If you don't have that, and they mix, you lose the fundamental proposition of having low latency. And this is basically, I, as I read it, this is a key difference in the classification of traffic between uh, these, these two schemes. Uh, Stuart mentioned this, um, that ECD1 is an input in L4S, uh, and it's not in SE, and that's actually precisely it. L4S uses ECD1 as an explicit classifier, where the endpoint says this traffic is latency sensitive, and this one is legacy. Uh, for, for, yeah. So, and then I see this is implicit. Uh, this relies on the network to do this classification. There's uh, the uh, SE proposal has the I think the cheap network queuing or cheap and nasty queuing, uh, which is an FQ like thing that tries to detect sparse flows from non sparse flows and so on. And I've always cringed at any network trying to figure out from my traffic mate, from my traffic signature, whether my flow should be low latency or not. I don't think that's a good idea going forward. So I would prefer an explicit uh, classification from the endpoints saying this traffic is uh, uh, low latency. And I think this is a significant and fundamental distinction. I just have two more points. Uh, the second point is about AQM and congestion control both having innovations. Personally, I don't want any innovation in AQM anymore. We've done this for, I don't know, 25 years, and I don't, our experience is basically to me shown very clearly that this may be one degree of freedom to many. Um, having a very simple AQM in the network allows for work to happen where it really matters and where it can be reasonably deployed in reasonable time scales. That is congestion control at the endpoints. Um, and we have experience with BCTCP style marking. We have experience, uh, when I say we have experience, I'm talking about the 10 plus years of experience that we've had in the industry in data center networks at Google, at Microsoft, with BCTCP. And uh, um, um, you know, uh, that's super, super helpful and useful for low latency traffic. And that's if we were to ever deploy something like this. Um, uh, I think that's the way that we would do it. Um, the third and final point is that of maturity. We know the amount of work that's gone into L4S. Uh, we've seen this work happen over the past three, four years, and it's been going through a lot of engagement and conversation with the IETF in and outside of the IETF. Um, and uh, as much as I would like to uh, consider SEE on equal footing, it just isn't. On equal footing. I don't want to, I want to be very clear about this. Um, the L4S is far more mature than SEE is. It is, uh, it is obviously seen a lot more thought, has had a lot more discussion, and it shows in the work. So between these three points, it is very, very clear to me that L4S is what we should do. I would, I would be very mindful about the fact that if we go with SEE, there are a lot of folks who may not be able to deploy it because the uh, uh, the in network mechanism becomes more complicated. That's it. I'm done.
All right, off mute. Stuart is next, I believe. Uh, I'm, I was going to say several things that repeat what Jana says, so I'll try to make it shorter. Uh, high level goal, from my personal opinion, uh, and to the extent I speak for Apple, Apple's opinion, moving forwards, ultra low latency communication is critical. And that means getting down as close as possible to the speed of light delay. We can't beat that, but we should get as close as we can. I'll go, give one little personal anecdote with this whole work from home that's been going on for the last couple of months. In Los Gatos, I have Comcast gigabit service. When I'm downloading a multi gigabyte iOS internal build to install on my phone, gigabit service is fantastic, really, really good. Uh, right now, I'm on this call from Santa Cruz by the beach because we have to shelter at home. So why not shelter at home where I can hear the waves? And here, I'm at the end of a little peninsula, as far as you can get from the phone office, and I have 300 kilobit per second DSL. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yeah. So interesting thing is that since I moved to Santa Cruz, people have told me that my video calls are much better than they used to be. So my 300 kilobit DSL is performing better than my gigabit cable. And I always knew, I always knew in theory that latency and jitter were as, just as important as throughput, but it really drove it home to me. My video frame rate here is not great, but the consistency and the quality of the, the voice communication is, uh, is much better than gigabit cable. So that's just one little example of why this industry pursuit of ever more and more throughput with, with no concern about latency and jitter, we've known about this for 20 years. It just continues to get worse. So. For future use cases that aren't just downloading big files, we need to be focusing on low latency. And to get really ultra low latency, we need ultra short queues in the network. And that means an ultra aggressive queue management algorithm to keep those queues ridiculously short. And if you do that to conventional traffic, you really hurt its throughput because conventional traffic does need some buffering in the network, not excessive buffering, not buffer bloat, but it needs some buffering. To break through that threshold and get even lower latency requires the end systems to understand this new ultra short queuing regime and to have a congestion control algorithm that's compatible with that. And following that line of thinking, if we want to break through what we know how to do now to even lower latency for future applications, the input traffic needs to signal its capability. Is it conventional traffic or is it this new traffic that can really cope with even shorter queues? So that's why after much time reading these documents and pondering it and trying to work out what I thought, because both sets of documents in isolation look like good suggestions. And if I'd read SCE before L4S, if SCE had come up 10, 12, 15 years ago, I think we'd all be using that now. But what we have now is L4S, which is better because it can push that latency even lower. And given how much I care about future things we're going to be doing on the internet that depend on that the latency can't be low enough. If we could make the speed of light faster, we could, but we don't know how to do that yet. So in pursuit of that ultra low latency goal, we need to use ECT1 as an input signal. And I'll finish by saying time is of the essence. We've had ECN around for 20 years and deployment in the practical internet is still close to zero. Meanwhile, modems have gone from 1200 board to gigabit networking and yet the gigabit networking to my house doesn't perform as well as this 300 kilobit dsl so this enormous void has opened up where throughput has charged ahead of latency and jitter and 
we're about a decade too late redressing that balance. So I do not want us to be going around in circles on this anymore. I want us to make a decision, make a clear decision, telegraph to the whole industry that this is the ITF consensus and it's time to get on with it. And with respect and appreciation to, to Jonathan and all the work that he's done, I'm afraid I'm fully behind L4S. Andrew. Hi, Andrew McGregor. Um, to avoid repetition, I'm plus one in, plus one in uh, both uh, Jana and Stuart's comments. I'd just like to say L4S very clearly wins us more and we learn more by attempting it. So in terms of what should we do, that seems like the the bold thing to do. I mean, every musician who has been stuck at home in uh, over the last few months um, would love to be able to rehearse online. That's currently impossible. It shouldn't be, but it is. There's another little detail that I noticed um, that hasn't been mentioned in between the two. SCE is clearly feasible to implement in hardware. That's a somewhat different thing from L4S, which is feasible on deployed hardware with software only changes. I can see how to get an L4S implementation working on several species of commodity switch chips, some of which are at this point five years old. Whereas SCE would require hardware changes. I'm not sure that it can be done even on the current generations purely with software changes. So it's significantly less deployable in the fast parts of the network, some of which are indeed over buffered. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, and I should, I just violated my own, my own rules, so I, I will quickly explain. Um, the goal here now is discussion. We'll go through, we'll advance slides when it, when it, when it makes sense. And we're going to try to make a decision towards the end of the meeting, about an hour or so from now. Okay, next in the queue, um, looks uh, like Uma. Yeah, this is Uma. Hi. hi. Uh, I have a clarification question. Uh, so we have, uh, is there any thought uh, that happened to make this work uh, that input signaling work in MPLS networks? Because uh, there's always this uh, issue with MPLS, how this can be deployed ECN network, right? ECN, even you start with ECN, right? Five, four, RFC 5462 has laid out uh, some stuff, uh, how to do this, even 5129. So, but uh, it's never been effectively worked in MPLS network. So is there any work went on? Because it's so critical here because input signaling has to be done. So all the MPLS nodes need to know and uh, segregate this traffic in separate queue. So this is much more important than earlier, whatever the work, whether it's working or not. Easy and stuff. Can I get your name again, please? For the notes. Sorry? Uh, could I get your name again, please, for the notes? My name is Uma, U M A. Thank you. No, I could speculate, but it's probably not productive, is the short answer to um, work on applying this to MPLS. Bob? Yeah, I just thought I'd jump in as um, one of the original authors of um, the ACN and MPLS draft, which um well not draft rfc 5129 you mentioned um although there's nothing at all um to stop any of this working on mpls i'm just interested to know what particular environment you're thinking of so that we can think about the problem you, you you've got because i i i wouldn't expect um many nodes in an MPLS network to be a bottleneck. And so just tell me what, what you're thinking briefly. Uh, so because th this work is so important for 3GPP, for example, 
So 3GPP and transport network MPLS is heavily used once you cross the base station E node B. So it is important, let's say if a service is terminated in the, let's say, and core network, uh, I'm not talking about the edge computing stuff. So if it's service is terminated, so it has to cross the backbone, uh, backhaul network. So that is uh, uh, mostly MPLS. Most uh, most of the deployments are MPLS. So how the uh, how the L4 signal uh, L4 signaling uh, will be accounted for and put into the separate queue in these MPLS networks if there is no mechanism uh, defined yet? Did Did you say L4 signaling? Oh, yeah. Oh, L4S or layer four? L4S, L4S okay. signal. Yeah. No, I mean, ECN um, is uh, in MPLS is designed to propagate up to um, the end systems, and L4S um, uses ECN, um, you know, signals and encapsulations just as it is, as as been pointed out on other slides. So it should just work, but there'll there'll be work to do, I'm sure, because. I doubt many implementations have actually tried to do um, ECN over MPLS, but um, there are specs for it, but it's, it, it, Correct. it would yeah. need to be implemented. Yeah. yeah. There, let's say, for example, in the ECN case, if uh, if some of the MPLS nodes not implemented, the uh, suggestions made in 5129, for example. Let me try and and call 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 and call time and call time on time on this topic. Um, questions being asked, I believe the answer is. Uh, not yet, not not yet, not yet Correct. designed. Inter in interesting area to dig. Okay. Yeah. And and Gary here. The, the, this is a topic we can easily pick up in a presentation in TSVWG where we're interested in this in the future. So don't be discouraged, but let's carry on with the agenda at the moment. Or in, uh, or in the the, the 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 famous words of a past AD: send draft. I think you're now your regular spot in the queue. Appreciate the help in MPLS. Okay, I, I just wanted to pick up a few um, questions, previous questions that I noted needed answers. Firstly, um, on Jana's point about needing multiple queues, um, I just wanted to make it clear that um, we've actually found that having two queues is better than having more than two queues. Um, uh, only, only slightly, but for instance, um, at the, I think, five nines percentile, um, having an FQ system, we could get um, eight milliseconds at, at the five nines percentile, eight milliseconds. In other words, um, uh, some packets had um, eight milliseconds of delay. With, um, without the two queues, uh, without multiple queues, with just two queues, we could actually get Less, much less than that. No, I, I think I've got these numbers right. Um, it was about it was about an order of magnitude less. Um, actually, I think the eight milliseconds must be wrong because I think maybe the eight milliseconds was what we could get, and the um, FQ system was an order of magnitude more than that. And that's because when you've got an FQ system, the network is the network scheduler is trying to guess which packets to put out next. Whereas if you've got a first in first out system, by definition, the first packet in is the first packet out. And so it's always going to be faster um, if you're trying to keep the queue short. Um, it's it's an odd result, but anyway, that, that was that point. Next point on Dave Tart's question about testing, uh, particularly on short flows and asymmetric, um, all the tests that L4S has ever published have been in, had short flows involved. Um, you know, the thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of tests we've done have involved um, mixes of traffic. I mean, we, we have done single flow tests, obviously, uh, and particularly to understand what single flows look like. But there's and, and if you look at the um, link I put on the Java um, in response to Dave's question, um, although I couldn't see Dave there, either as Rube or Dave, um, the the tests we've been doing recently all they're, they're, there's all manner of different um numbers of short flows as well as long flows um so you know that isn't should not be a criticism the the second point about asymmetric that is a good point and we have tested accurate ecn in that environment but not 
um, the whole system. So that's certainly something I'd, I'd add to our testing um, queue. And um, one of the points we made in our slides was that we've designed Accurate ECN to deal with act thinning. Um, and we've been involved in trying to ensure that Quick does act thinning correctly itself so that the network isn't incentivized to start trying to work out which Quick packets to thin. Um, because um, thin asymmetric links are a big problem and they're only not a problem at the moment on the internet because um, you know, the technologies like uh, satellite and DOCSIS and LTE actually do the act thinning for the end systems. So um, that's that's a very important area that needs to be sorted out. Um, next question, I'll try and answer. Um, just just um, there was a point about, uh, I think it was Andrew McGregor about um, implementation in hardware. And just to point out that the DOCSIS implementation in hardware, in cable modem hardware by, uh, by two vendors um, has to two chipsets has all been done in software on top of the hardware. There was no, it, it's a software upgrade, field upgrade. There's no need for any new hardware. Um, and that was, that sort of supports the point that Andrew made. And, that, and that's it. That's all the um, points I wanted to answer. Here you go. Here. Um, I ended the queue because I really wanted to underline this point about strong incentives for deployment that other people made. For me, the goal really here is to provide a new traffic handling, a new kind of service that enables new congestion control and is based on what we know about what the network needs now. And the whole point about this is, in, in fact, not being compatible with the old handling of TCP and not being like, in, in a sense, like completely fair um, to this traffic. The whole point is to like where possible have a separation and of course like if this is not possible there should not be like completely starving the kind of old-fashioned traffic but i think it's also important to have an incentive to move to this new traffic handling um and to make sure that this provides enough benefit that people actually see want to use it and that's like my worry about um if we just pick something up which seems to be much easier to deploy but only provides a minor benefit then we end up in the same situation we have been before, where like ECN is not adopted because it's not seen to provide a big benefit. While if we have a chance to change the whole system where we can actually do much more modern things in congestion control at the endpoints uh, in a kind of separate um, traffic handling and network, that's a real chance and we shouldn't game it. Okay, Dave Todd. is uh, the queue of responses to responses is getting overly long. And I have a set of notes. One of the L4S prerequisites, one of the L4S thinkings is that all traffic is greedy. And that really is not the case in the case of video conferencing or in the example that Andrew used it, a bunch of musicians, which includes myself, that would actually like to collaborate over the internet. Audio data is incredibly low bit rate. It is the conflict with greedy traffic that makes it nearly it makes it very difficult to actually express real-time audio data over the internet. Now, I know that fair queuing really isn't a part of this conversation, but that solves that problem beautifully. Non-greedy traffic never, never, zero, never experiences any latency relative to the greedy traffic on the link. Four years ago, using Cake over the Sonic ISP and DIFSER, end to end, preserved there, I actually did manage to achieve a collaborative audio experience. And uh, when we talk about an end to end identifier, DIFSER has always been the preferred IETF solution to specifying network some network behaviors or a class of traffic on the internet. So I uh, would like to see DIFSER not get scribbled on as much as it does today. And I've really kind of lost track of all the other comments done so far. Um, so that's all I'm going to say so far. Thank you very much. Okay, Martin, please tell us whether you're wearing your AD hat or not before speaking. Uh, most, most emphatically, we have no hats on at all. This is Martin Duke. Um, 
so SCE is is uh, good work, and you know I think if SCE were uh, adopted widely in the internet, it would be a significant improvement in the, its overall behavior as, as traffic behavior. Uh, I share Mira's concerns about the deployment of incentives for SCE. Um, on the other hand, L4S, if we can get it to work right, really is um, a potentially transformative um, new kind of service in the in the internet that is broadly applicable. And that enables all sorts of new applications. And I think we should really kind of go big if we possibly can. And really the only concern for me is, is this safe or not? And uh, unfortunately, you know, I really ask the working group, uh, the, you know, when I hear the working group to, to try to think about that. And, and it's a daunting thing to try to, to assess as Bob and his team have done just an enormous number of tests on a, on a fairly wide range of scenarios. I think there's always room for doubt, um, you know, the, the nature of traffic on the internet could always change, and that's a risk that we have to assess. Um, and uh, what was this other? Um, and so anyway, so like, and and of course, there's always there there's some there are some sort of unfairness issues in 3168 queues that that they've been working to address in TCP prog uh, that have. Um, you know that that are sort of complicated. So there there's sort of a a an argument from humility that um that just the, the 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 limits of scoping testing and the sort of the human limits of designing these algorithms may introduce some risk. Um, because I we covered a ton of scenarios. Uh, certainly, what we were able to, to conceive of for the most part. So I mean, I, you know, personally, I'm comfortable with that trade-off given given the given the payoff to this. But uh, I think that's probably the question for a lot of the maybe the undecided people out there is if you look at this research and the testing that's been done, uh, where do you think we are? Okay, Jonathan. Mm. I think Martin just brought up the key point: if we can make it work right. Um. And to that, I think I have to point to the tests that um, the SE team posted a few days ago, which are perhaps less voluminous than the L4S test suite, but they do raise some concerns. They highlight some scenarios in which the L4S heuristic to enable um, friendly cooperation with existing traffic uh, appears to fail. Now, I will acknowledge that one of the major problems that that test, that our tests uncovered has since been fixed. That was due to a bug with handling packet loss. Um, but the detection of ECN AQMs that do not implement the L4S semantics is, I think, not reliable enough yet. And we have doubts about whether it can be made reliable. So, I think that is the major question for the working group to consider. Is there enough evidence that L4S is safe to deploy? And if not, SCE offers a solution that should be safe to deploy. Uh, and SCE offers two levels of service. Uh, the basic service is designed to operate over the general internet with relatively long paths and offer queuing delays targeting about two and a half milliseconds, which over your uh, 80 millisecond median internet path is pretty much nothing. Now, I remember Stuart talking about his um, low latency on, lower latency on ADSL than on cable. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I, I feel his pain because I live in rural Finland. The cell tower is at least a mile away. Right now I've shaped everything down to one megabit a second in order to make this call. And it works perfectly well because I have normal AQM 
and I, and I think the problem is that the cable network that Stuart has does not implement AQM at all. So implementing AQM at all is a big latency win. Implementing SCE doubles that improvement. And SCE also has a solution for implementing a low latency service. Uh, using a separate input classifier in the diff serve field. So um, please consider that solution as well. Okay. Before I go on to Roland, John, can I push you down the queue a little bit to let others who haven't had a first chance to speak uh, say something uh, before calling on you? Please go ahead. All right, John, I'm going to do that. Uh, yes. Roland. Yeah, I just uh, want to express that I don't like to see this discussion so much as SCE versus L4S. I think the decision is about the ECT1 semantics. And I think uh, that having a, a different output for signaling the congestion level is, is more useful for other future approaches too. And so using a DSCPS classifier for FRS and using ECT1 as signal is another possibility I'd like to see. And, and I find it architecturally a bit cleaner. Okay. Pete? Thank you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Jonathan Jonathan said about our testing, and that was um, in regards to the L4S findings. Uh, we did find false negatives, as he mentioned. It's generally in the case where um, you configure the AQM with non default settings, say lower target or interval, and you can cause it to believe that it's a, an L4S queue, and, and you, will, you will starve non L4S traffic in that case. So we, we need to be aware of that. But also, there are false positives, which in that case, if you have, it's, it's only two milliseconds more of jitter that can result in underutilization because the, the link hasn't been identified as, or has rather been identified as RFC 3168 when it isn't. So there is more work to do on that. I, they may be aware of this, but I think this needs to be made to work before deployment. And uh, finally, I would question whether ultra low delay as we're thinking about it as less than you know one millisecond let's say it's actually achievable for internet traffic which is very bursty um, there are significant reduces in utilization that you can see in some of the tests that the, the burstiness tests that we did i would only like to raise the question that let's make sure that this goal of achieving one millisecond delay or less is actually achievable when you know we can show that we can we can get 2.5 milliseconds of delay and still get much better utilization in the face of bursty traffic. So I guess that's I, and last lastly I would just comment that I agree with Roland's statement that this is a decision about the code point. This is not a decision between you know ECT L4S or ECT SCE. I just want to clarify what you're saying there. Are you saying that it's not possible? to get millisecond latency, or are you saying that even if it was, it wouldn't be useful? I'm saying I think we could all agree that it would be useful if we could get delay from 2.5 milliseconds down to one millisecond. What I'm saying is I'm questioning whether that is really achievable with real internet traffic, because if I take a single L4S flow and I simulate Wi-Fi with NetEM, that takes the throughput from 45 megabits a second to 4.5. We just have to look at that seriously. Now, now maybe things change when there are a lot of flows through a link and the parameters are different. I'm, I'm testing, you know, single flows here. I just think it needs to be thought about seriously that that is actually an achievable goal for, for bursty traffic. To me, that makes a really good argument for segregating the traffic. That for my downloads, yeah, I'd love my 45 megabits per second. For my video conference calls, four megabits of low latency would be about 10 times more than I need. But I thought that the goal of L4S was to have both low latency and high throughput. 
And that's why the traffic is differentiated on input for the traffic that prefers low latency, for the traffic that can tolerate slightly higher latency to get better throughput. I think I've probably, I think others can contribute further from this, but I think I've raised, raised what I wanted to raise for now. Thank you. Okay, next three, and in terms of queue management will be, um, I'm gonna do uh, Jake, go back to Jana and then Bob. So Jake. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, going back to the points that Miria raised, um, the, the core issue here is that it, to me, one of the major core issues, I should say, is that it breaks 3168 queues. So uh, this is also a point Jonathan made. Um, the you know, regular ECN actually does a lot of good here, and we're starting to see rollout. And what I don't want to see happen is, and what you know, L4S with a with a inadequate detection mechanism, which it's questionable whether it can be made adequate to me. Um, this breaks regular ECN 3168 queues, which are in the process of gaining some level of adoption. And I would urge that we not like disrupt that, that adoption as it's, as it's uh, kicking up. Thank you. Jenna Ingar, um, just very quickly to Jake's point. I think we've waited 25 years for 3168 to get deployed. Um, I'm not holding my breath for seeing it get much more widely deployed than it currently is. Um, so I, I wanted to quickly respond to a few things. One uh, was that I had uh, mentioned multiple queues and Bob corrected me, or not corrected me, Bob said that two queues are, are uh, 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 about two queues versus versus many. My point there was to say that we can't have a, one queue. We need to have at least two queues. And I, I, can, I can believe that two queues are adequate. I need to think a little bit more about that. But I think um, it's clear to me that we need at least uh, two. Um, and we need to move away from one queue. So we need a differentiator. Implicit or explicit is a question. Explicit to me is much more sensible uh, and something that I would want to build. Implicit has a lot of problems. Um, on the traffic mix, I wanted to correct the record here. In general, people uh, 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 want to be very clear about how it is that traffic is divided in the network. Typically, yes, 80% of connections, or a large number of connections anyways, about 80%, tend to be small connections, but about 80% of the bytes by volume tend to be from really long connections. So whenever anybody is doing any experiment with this traffic mix, please be mindful of this. Um, not all, uh, 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 in terms of bytes, your traffic is mostly going to be from long flows. Um, one thing that I would like to uh, uh, mention uh, for the folks going forward, and this is speaking to Martin Duke's point about uh, safety. Um, we, the experiments need to start considering BBR as a real uh, uh, condition controller, not just the sawtooth. The sawtooth has become, uh, uh, is quickly becoming old news in the sense that there's a lot of deployed traffic now that is a BBR or something else. It is very important to consider this going forward if we want to have real deployment in the, in the, in the internet. Um, uh, I basically wanted to also raise the higher point here that yes, safety is important, but we can discuss those things in the working group going forward. This is not about finalizing the details of a particular mechanism. Uh, but it's important for us to remember that deployability is absolutely key here. As Stuart pointed out earlier, we waited for long enough. We should have done this. We should be ashamed of ourselves that we haven't done this yet. Um, and we are still trying to figure out precisely if we can get RTD fairness. It seems like a really silly discussion to be having when the higher order discussion we should be having is how can we get low latency right now in the network? For that, what I want to see is a proposal that we have been working on for a while that we can move forward on. And we should be all in agreement that we want to move forward and really get to the point of having low latency networking becoming a possibility really, really soon. 
Um, so please keep in mind that deployability is absolutely essential here. Uh, safety always takes hits here and there in terms of what happens to legacy traffic. To me, that's that's we can figure out what the cost there is, but the future there's a lot more of the future than there is of the past. Um, so let's keep that in mind going ahead. Bob is next, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer queue management to West, since I believe I'm 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 uh, up after Bob in the queue. Okay, again, I I wanted to try and pick up on some points uh, very quickly on Dave Tart's um, saying that L4S's assumption is that all traffic is greedy. That's um, a sort of um, the wrong way around. L4S is aimed at being able to ensure that greedy traffic can also have low latency. It doesn't mean all traffic is greedy. Um, it, it, uh, and that's a, you know, a lot of the um, traffic that's being tested and um, Ingemar has been doing a lot on this is, is not greedy. But the point is when other traffic comes in or when the capacity reduces on a radio network or whatever, it becomes greedy and you want to make sure you keep the low latency. It's the consistent low latency, whether it's greedy or not. Um, and it may adapt down, but you know there's a period when it's um, it, it hits the ceiling, if you like. Um, on testing of, of, of the fallback, I wanted to. Uh, I did jump in earlier to say, you know, I'm I'm not yet happy with it. Um, we haven't completed it yet. Um, it took much longer than I thought to get. Um, visualization of the large number of experiments so because so, we thought we had it working and you know we tried a number of cases and all the rest of it and they all seemed fine but then it's only when we explored the whole space and and managed to visualize it that we saw okay there's this pattern here and so um we are at a, a, at a point now where we can um very much more rapidly um try out new algorithms and and see very quickly, whether they work across the whole space, um, and um, you know the, the the point that Jonathan made about uh, and, and Pete about false positives and false negatives. Um, all the false negatives, which were where uh, let me get the false negative thing the right way around. Um, that means where you um, think it's. Uh, I, I'm, my brain's gone dead. Right, I'll do the false positives first because for some reason I can find that easier. Um, false positive means you think it's a classic Q, but it isn't. And so um, you continue to behave as L4S. Um, or the the um, L4S flow continues to behave aggressively, um, thinking it's a classic Q and it isn't. All the cases where that occurred were where there wasn't any um classic traffic whenever there was classic traffic it um it, we didn't get those false positives a apart from one there was one case in um i think now four thousand experiments and you can find that red dot if you like in in the in the experiments um but the other the other way we have got far too many false negatives at the moment which is where um l4s um changes to classic when it doesn't need to and I don't like that because obviously that's not going to be good for L4S service. It's generally at the low rates, and that's because um, we th we thought that when it's at a low rate, it's not going to matter that much because um, we we looked at the cases where we didn't run the algorithm, and we found, well, okay, even if it gets it wrong, it's still not um, particularly unfair because there isn't that much rate to be unfair in. And and when when TCP Prague is in a squeezed capacity, it tends to become closer to 50-50 with with cubic and 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 other other types of flows, and that that's actually borne out by all the experiments. If you if you look where there's false um, positives, did I say that right? I can't, I can't get it right. Anyway, um, where where it's getting the detection wrong, and it's switching to classic when it shouldn't. It's um, it's still, in terms of fairness, it's absolutely fine. So, <clears throat> but I but I don't want to, do want to get rid of them because it's it's underutilizing the link, and I'm I'm sure we can do better 
now that we, we can see those points. Um, then what was the other, the next one? Um, oh, yes. Um, Jonathan mentioned that um, SCE has, has uh, focused on being on, um, on, on the safety issue, particularly, and, you know, it is, it is inherently um, much safer in that, um, you know, it, it's not going to have those fairness issues, but that's not the only possible safety issue. You've got a, um, in, in L4S, you've got an ambiguity for the CE code point, but in SC, you've got an ambiguity for the ECT0 code point. And if there are black holes, and um, Dave Tart discovered a, a, what looked like a bit of a um, black hole this morning, in fact, on a, on a, um, his tunnel software, the, but but if you've got a firewall, for instance, that is black holing ECT one packets, um, SCE is is um, taking all ECT zero traffic, whether it's part of the experiment uh, SCE experiment or not, and it's marking it with ECT one. And then, if the end system understands that, it will do something about it. But that means that the experiment is being applied to all traffic, not just the experimental traffic. And if there is a problem with ECT one. The network is then switching stuff over to ECT1 and throwing it at that problem, and then that problem kills it. So, to say that SE is inherently safe, it's inherently safe for the problem that Jonathan has thought he needs to worry about safety on. But there are other problems on the internet. All right, thanks, Bob. I'm going to go to. Okay, so this is David's uh, speaking without any hat. Um, Observe that discussion uh, so far has focused very much on the edge networks. I've heard cable modem, we've heard uh, DSL, we've heard 3G. Um, want to inject uh, more of the internet into this. In particular, my background is, is data centers. Latency is a controllable problem in data centers. It's nowhere near as bad as you, you, you can build up in, uh, in a base station or access point for a, uh, for a wireless link. But there's a bigger problem, which is in-cast. Everybody tries to send to the same queue all at once. Yeah, yeah, stuff gets synchronized. The one of our peak congestion controls like DCTCP are a good solution to this because they tend to they tend to run the queues empty. DCTCP has been slow to deploy in data centers due to the risks of of getting it into the same queue um, as conventional TCP traffic, whether it's Reno, Reno or Cubic. You're one fat fingered mistake away from putting those two putting those two in the same queue, and then the TCP traffic whatever's using it breaks. Um, and to really foul things up, all it takes is is a, is a runaway config script. Um, I will say that this that the the use of the two code points to clearly distinguish CE and SCE traffic and swapping over DC TCP and the like to use SCE is very attractive in making DC TCP easier to deploy in data um, in, uh, in in data center environments. And the other observation is that to the extent that the that the trade-offs among these appear to vary by network type, that's heading into the problem area that DSCPs and diff server intended to solve. And that's that's it for me. All right, thank you, David. And then uh, next in the queue is Aiden Burstein. Hi, uh, this is Idan from uh, Mellanox. Um, um, Mellanox is doing networking for data centers, so I'm going to bring um, uh, our point of view from the data center world. So um, when you have a controlled and uh, a controlled network, a controlled environment where you can, you know your infrastructure um, networking hardware, you know how it's configured, you control it, um, then um, you typically differentiate your services with the traditional ways of differentiating services. Um, for example, a priority or a DSCP. Uh, those are valid options that 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 actually exist and people are using them. Um, for example, Mellanox uh, is uh, deploying in data centers today um, a transport which is uh, which is hardware assisted, 
hence it has different um, characteristics of uh, of uh, operation like for example it can uh, push a lot of bandwidth um, uh, very fast and stuff other other uh, traffic uh, other traffic uh, traffic types um, and this is typically uh, and, and and the way it's differentiated from other services um, from other transport types or other services in the in in in, in data centers is uh, typically priority or DSCP. Um, so um, I, I, I think, uh, f from my point of view, um, we have uh, we have two bits in the IP header that are there um, for enabling uh, for for en enabling uh, congestion control algorithms. And as uh, DCTCP have shown, ECN is significantly important. Um, the, even this one bit notification is significantly important for enabling low latency communication um, uh, hence uh, 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 i think that uh, that that uh, using this uh, the 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 re reserved um the the reserve state in this in this uh, two bit uh, field uh, can, for... I can i just clarify what you said you said different congestion control algorithms did you mean that, or did you mean different queuing algorithms? Congestion control is at the endpoints; queuing is in the network. What 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 I what I meant um, <clears throat> what, what I what I meant is that is that for example, when this TCP was was uh, was uh, was was uh, first deployed, <laughs> um, the data centers uh, operators typically differentiated to um services running on two different congestion control algorithms according to priority so they would not interfere with each other so you would have um two different congestion control algorithms being mapped into two different um services in the network for example priority or dscp And this is what people are doing today with high-speed transports, like <laughs> like uh, like uh, Rocky and IWOP, um, which are hardware accelerated. Um, so so anyway, we have we have uh, only two bits in the ACN field, and um, and 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 and. Can you get to the point? Yeah, and better better congestion control. Better congestion control uh, eventually uh, implies better latency. And I think this is not marketed well in SCE today. So I think that if I'm not speaking about the SCE proposal specifically, but I think that if we will use um, uh, these bits, this this uh, this reserve re reserved um, state as an output from the network, we will be able to to enable low latency traffic in data centers, and and. Um, and, and, and the way we, we would be able to enable this is by enabling congestion control algorithms that would react faster to congestion states. And uh, this, I think, would be significantly important for data centers. Um, so um, I, from, from this, uh, for, from a data center standpoint, I, I do not understand how L4S um, enables something Further than what is enabled today with DSCP and priority, and uh, that's my point here. Thank you. And Ingemar is next in the queue. Okay, do you hear me? Hello? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, it was about uh, what was the discussion on uh, jitter in jitter in Wi-Fi, and uh, that makes it uh, more or less uh, meaningless to have low latency service. But I want to point out, as I also point uh, explain on the list, that uh, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't uh, use uh, today's uh, snapshot to sort of uh, determine what uh, just tomorrow's uh, technology can bring. Because uh, if you look in uh, free PP access, then uh, we have been with LTE. We have been using one millisecond time slots for a long while, and uh, we then or we thought probably will start with the one millisecond time slots. But there is option to use the shorter time slot, and with that you will do, reduce network jitter. 
and I can I can imagine that the other trans, trans, uh, access technologies and also uh, network trans, transport technologies will also uh, evolve over time. So uh, it will go down in the network. That I'm uh, fully uh, believe uh, strongly. And then also discussing about not greedy traffic, and uh, well, well, we we are looking at, uh, at that for us pretty much from a, a not greedy traffic perspective. And in, the, in this case, it's about uh, gaming traffic and uh, remote control uh, of vehicles. And then you typically have some uh, upper limit of your bit rate, could be 10 megabit per second or 40 megabits per second or whatever. And also we have a case where you have the sources, which are the video decoders that are also, uh, that are limited in their bit rate that they, they produce. So that is uh, more or less not greedy traffic all the time. And, and that's uh, what, what I want to say that uh, it's not about only uh, greedy traffic uh, in this case. But the uh, L4S can give a possibility to make not greedy traffic uh, co cooperate with uh, greedy traffic. All the same links. That's what uh, I had. So sorry. Thank you. And next in the queue is Nikki P. Nikki P. Okay. Hi, sorry, I thought I had unmuted myself, but um, I guess it didn't take. Um, so uh, this is Nikki Pantelius from uh, Broadcom. We are in, uh, among other things, the cable access space, um, making equipment both for the cable modem and for the uh, head end equipment that is at the operator premises. Um, so uh, I wanted to comment on an item that was on a later slide about SCE, SCE having been implemented um, at the CPE and at the data center. Um, and uh, the, the spot where we sit in the network is actually neither of those. Um, we are usually the bottleneck uh, on the link and we are not either um, a Linux stack running in a laptop or uh, kind of big iron switches and um, networks running in a data center. And um, so our implementation concerns at this point in the network, I think, are very different. And some of the things that were listed that are important to us are uh, not having to inspect the layer four header, um, being compatible with accenting, and uh, being able to, to do this with a dual queue implementation. Um, in particular, the um, uh, the implementations in progress that we have that Bob Briscoe mentioned on cable modems using existing hardware, um, those would definitely not be possible with um, an approach that requires fair queuing. Um, the, the per flow queuing and scheduling uh, would be very burdensome, I think, at both ends. Uh, even if we were to create new hardware, these things would be uh, very burdensome. So uh, we, you know, when we did consider that early on, uh, when we were looking at how to reduce latency in cable networks, uh, we are now pretty far down this path of um, the using ECT1 in the manner that L4S uh, wants to use it. And we are very happy with how that's worked out in terms of the implementation trade-offs. That's all. Great. Uh, next in the queue is Ram Ranganathan. Hi. Um, Hi, I'm Ram Ranganathan from, <clears throat> from Comstock. Um, yeah, I'm also in the same space as Nikki. I'm in the, so Comstock is in uh, uh, the business of making cable modems and head and equipment called CPS. And uh, there was discussions related to AQM um, in cable networks and the use of it. It's definitely increasing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, latency was, an, was a much more critical issue than what it was three, four, five years ago. So AQMs are rolling out and we have actually uh, been working on experiments to look at the behavior with traditional AQM support, as well as now with the newer, uh, you know, dual, dual queue uh, at, with uh, L4S kind of capabilities and ECN support. And what the difference where we see is 
you know, AQM is doing its thing. Definitely, it, it is a very powerful tool. It reduces latency. The challenge it faces in keeping a consistent low latency in some cases is when there is a bigger pipe. You have a lot of bursty traffic from different flows. Uh, so the difference what we have seen uh, with our experiments that takes us with an L4S and an ECN style is a consistent latency under 10 milliseconds, right? So uh, with AQM, typically you get that, but there are bursts where it's unable to handle and maintain it when the burst comes together. But with an L4S and a dual Q separation, we are consistently five, six, seven milliseconds in the window uh, to handle specifically the low latency traffic. And we, so far, at least, we have not seen a single impact on, at least a significant impact on the classic traffic that's mixed in that window. Um, so if you're wanting to offer a low latency service like a URL LC or something, it's a great, great way to approach it. And having something elegant like uh, you know, L4S-based ECNs is probably the neatest way to do it in our opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And next in the queue is Greg. Uh, hi, I, um, I just wanted to come back to um, one other point that I think is important to, to think about here. Um, and that is the, um, you know, that these, these bits are fairly precious, right, in the, in the IP header. Um, and um, with the O4S proposal, um, the, the idea of potentially being able to reclaim the ECT zero code point at some point in the future for uh, another purpose is a pretty attractive uh, characteristic, um, whereas with SCE, um, both well, all, all of the code points effectively in the ECN field are um, uh, are used uh, forever. Um, so I think that's something that we should uh, consider again for the long term for uh, deployability and use of uh, low latency and ECN across the internet, uh, having the ability to uh, you know, do the next thing um, at some point in the future is a pretty important one. And then Lars, you're next in the queue. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So uh, this is a meta comment, but um, no matter what we do, we need to make a decision now. I think Jana has sort of been alluding to that too, right? We've waited too long already. This is, you know, progressed at the usual speed of the ITF transport area, which is not exactly fast. So the, the, the last thing I wanna have is more discussion on this. We need to come to a decision based on what we know now, and then we need to live with it. So I, I, I don't want us to, the one thing I want to take off the table is to let you know, throw more time at it, which is, is basically, you know, not doing anything. I, I do want to do something. I don't, almost don't care what it is. So I'm not going to state my favorites here, but we need to come to a decision now. That's good. And then Stuart, you're next in the queue. Thank you. Uh, I have three comments to make the reactions to things I've heard over the last half an hour. Uh, one is we've heard more than once that there's no point lowering latency because what about Wi-Fi? And I have to say I found that a very pedestrian and unambitious stance. Some things are connected by Ethernet that has sub-millisecond latency. And we are doing work at Apple on lowering the latency of Wi-Fi. And we're also doing work, including on this call, to lower the latency in the internet. So to point at some other thing and say, well, they suck, so we shouldn't try, I, I reject that argument. Uh, second point is I've seen some assumptions that video conferencing traffic is inelastic and will just overflow the network because it's not congestion controlled. I think we all know that's not true. Even video conferencing traffic will scale its frame rate and its image quality to fit the available capacity. The only difference is that it wants to do that while keeping low latency. And then the final thing I've heard is some fear that traffic will cheat and set CT1 to get better treatment in the network. And that is not viable because the difference here is in the L4S proposal, ECT zero traffic says, I want the best throughput possible with low latency. 
and ECT1 traffic says, I want even lower latency. And if that means not being quite so far out on the curve of maximum throughput, I'll trade off a bit lower throughput for lower latency. So the only benefit you would get by cheating is lower throughput. So if what you want is ultra low latency and you don't mind the lower throughput, that's not cheating, that's getting what you want. If you wanted the highest throughput, then that cheating just shot yourself in the foot. So the good property of any system like this is that there has to be no incentive to cheat. If cheating actually gives you worse behavior, then there's no incentive to do it. So I'm not concerned about Wi-Fi latency and jitter because work is being done to fix that. I am not concerned that video conferencing traffic is inelastic because it's not. And I'm not concerned about cheating because there's no benefit to cheating. You. And then next in the queue is uh, someone whose ID is L. Yumuskar. Francisco. Um, I have a few comments, very short. Um, one is about a, um, safety in the internet. So this, this, all this discussion is mostly uh, indeed for the access network, but we have to consider that there are many, many examples where you may have bottlenecks going through the network, through the aggregation network, transit networks, et cetera. So which means that safety is important because in those scenarios, you're gonna get uh, all the endpoints need to guess uh, what to do. Um, AQM there won't be able to, to manage that. This is important to consider. So we, it's something that, of course, is gonna break all the considerations about low latency because it's gonna fade away. So this is important. So it's not just a data center use case where you have a single switch and everything is managed locally. So it's not going to be the case. Uh, the other the other point about a elasticity for applications like WebEx, the one we use right now, it's not elastic because uh, so you know, all the video streams are sent no matter what if you have enough bandwidth to to send them. So if you have a Rate video quality one or video quality two, they will be sent no matter what. And so there's no elasticity, they are sent in any case. So, uh, uh, and uh, there's no condition control most of the time because you're using FEC. You're 100% wrong on that because when I'm on gigabit, my upload stream is two megabits per second. Here I'm on 300 kilobits. There is no way it can send two megabits over a three kilobit link. It has to adapt to the available rate. In any case, you're not going to use more than two megabits per second. So it's not elastic. I mean, it's uh, of course, if you have a, uh, a very low uplink, then you may see one of the two uh, video qualities because there's not enough bandwidth to, to use the two, but that's it. There's no typical elasticity, it's mostly FEC. But anyway, this is just the other thing about wireless. So, wireless C, and uh, so there's going to be a to do AX coming in. Uh, we need to support wireless as well. And uh, we need to consider that it's going to be very heterogeneous, meaning there will be a wireless bottleneck sometimes, sometimes not. So it will be an uplink bottleneck, sometimes just the, the, the uplink and not the downlink. And maybe this is going to change at night, where you're going to see the aggregation network being a bottleneck. And so uh, when we say there's going to be very easy and simple to get a dual queue everywhere, well, it's going to be very simple because dual queue will be needed only in the CMTS or in the cable modem, this is false. We, we will be we, many bottleneck will coexist in the future for a very long time. And so safety is gonna be an issue as an important feature that I consider very important for all applications, not just for low latency applications. And I'm done. Thank you. And uh, Jonathan, you're next. I have a couple of people further on that haven't spoken yet. So just be short if you can. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've heard a number of comments that um, uh, that, that uh, basically boil down to Alpha Vespa has been worked on for a long time, and we should just get on with it. And I'd like to remind everyone of the sunk cost fallacy here. So the the, uh, the major point to remember here that it has not yet been 
properly demonstrated that the ambiguity of the congestion experienced signal has been resolved. Uh, we have counterexamples, and I think Bob admitted that more work was needed. So I think that a decision in favor of using ECT1 as an input to the network would be premature if taken today. And if we want to take any decision today, It would, be, it would be better to decide not to use ECT1 at all and just to use RFC 3168 as it is now. And that would already be an improvement if, if more widely deployed. You don't need a fair queuing for that. You don't even need approximate fairness. You just need to actually deploy it. And in recent years, we now have uh, AQMs that are much easier to configure and deploy than before. Red was a bit of a disaster. Cordell is much better. Pi is much better. So please deploy ECN in some form. Okay. And uh, then Sebastian, I think you plus queued and then minus queued. Uh, so skipping you. If I can say a few words uh, towards this. Can I just remember you only have 15 minutes left to get your final questions in. So make make sure the answers are short, please. Thank you. The questions are short. Go. Can I? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, just as an answer to Stuart, he noticed that cheating your way into the L4S low latency queue is backfire because you're getting less throughput. But the point is, it's currently implemented the L4S low latency queue gives you both higher throughput and lower latency. There is really no incentive not to cheat. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Then uh, Anna, you're next. Anna, are you there? Sorry, my mute button didn't work. Uh, uh, yes, I wanted to ask a clarifying question because I was also a little bit confused when Stuart talked about the two queues. My understanding is that the, the goal here for L4S is that all the traffic should go in the uh, L4S queue eventually. And this is also how you could reclaim the ECT0 mark. So I was a little bit confused about part of this discussion. like to respond just wanted to clarify that yeah. i'll respond very briefly because we don't have much time left my expectation is that we will have legacy reading traffic on the internet for a long time so i think at this stage hope of reclaiming ect zero is about as likely as retiring ipv4 so for the foreseeable future, we will have smarter congestion control algorithms that keep Q short, and then we'll have an enormous long tail of old devices using classic Reno that will never be updated, and they will be in the other queue. Yes, so uh, just to understand, so that I understand correctly, this, I, this is I agree, we will have a long tail, but I guess the, the hope is that for different types of both the high utilization and the low latency traffic should be able to go in the Alcaraz queue. This is how I have may, may, Maybe a clarification from me, Kundusper here. Um, I think we, we will need at least two queues for a while because there is still the drop-based traffic. I guess not all traffic will use uh, ECN in the future as well. So we still have the both options, let's say, but from the other hand, it's possible to use the Alpha Rescue also for high throughput. Um, it depends, of course, how much bursty traffic is mixed in it because it will then make gaps where the throughput cannot be fully utilized but if you really want high throughput you still can use the 
let's say the, the classic queue even without ect0 because drop based packets are still there if you're non ect you will always be there and i agree also that ect0 will take a very long time to to uh, get rid of that so it will still be available may i just add a data point that the ecn nonce was likely to have been used in possibly one network somewhere in scandinavia on the internet and it took 20 years to reclaim that code point so i reckon we've got to the point where we can try and figure out what we've learned apart from the fact that um, it takes a long time to recall points. Um, 2016, we had a pretty strong consensus to start work on L4S. Um, and I think I'm, we've heard quite a bit about what people have thought since then. That's great. Do we have enough information to make decisions we need to make today. Wes, do you actually have questions you want to ask? Uh, well, maybe I'll summarize what I've heard, mm. uh, see if that generates some questions that you'd like to follow up with. But uh, there's been a great discussion, and uh, I think there continues to be support for using ECT1 as an input. Uh, we heard a range of opinions though, so this is not unanimous support, um, but there does seem to be a, uh, a, a majority, I'm not sure that it's a consensus yet, but it's a majority that uh, spoken, have expressed uh, support as an input. Um, there are definitely some that would like to use it as an output and uh, some that would like to use DSCP uh, uh, as well. So I think we heard a, the whole spectrum of thoughts. Uh, if we go forward using uh, uh, ECT1 as an input, there are concerns about the classic bottleneck detection and uh, fallback. So that will remain an important bit of work that uh, we'll be doing. Uh, there sounds like there are uh, bits of open work uh, that we will need to continue to discuss related to some data links like Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I think there's still some discussion uh, probably around the cheating scenarios and and details to be worked through about what happens with uh, uh, flows that cheat. So uh, those sound like sort of three areas of uh, ongoing work needed if ECT1 as an input uh, is indeed the consensus of the working group. So that, that's my summary of what I've heard. And maybe Gori, David, if you want to ask some questions to the working group, uh, it's a good time to, to do so. Okay, from my perspective, when we did the BOF on L4S, people were very unconcerned about the transport reaction and the fallback case. They thought these were things in endpoints that would eventually be fixed as TCP and other transports evolved. And yet we heard quite a lot about that as being the sticking point. So. I'd be interested if that really is the thing that should stop us doing any standardization work or whether it's a thing we think we can just fix in the specs as we move on, because this also seems to be an important part of knowing which way to go ahead. I see Jana in the line. Jana? Oh, you got it. Um, we expect to have work to do in the working group after this point, right? So it seems to me that we should be looking to see if we can make the decision on ECT1 so that we can stop running around in circles between these proposals and then figure out what work we actually need to do in the working group. It sounds like the things that you're listening, Wes, and the point you're making, Gauri, are basically work that we will want to do and we can do going forward um, uh, in the working group. And these are completely solvable problems. We just have to figure out how to do them. We may not have perfect solutions, 
but such is life. Um, but yes, let's let's please make the decision so that we can work on the problems going forward. Okay, Debbie, you got a comment on that? Um, yeah, I think um, the safety of whatever we roll out is crucial. Um, this is a, a something that uh, I, um, influences what we decide to do. We must not break things out there um, as part of working towards improving them. There's an interesting uh, piece of technology has been mentioned so far, and I apologize to this, this, this late in here, which is um, in a different context, uh, the NQB PHP draft. There is the concept of queue protection or traffic protection um, that might apply the class of disincentive um, that seems to be seems to be envisioning uh, it might be something that help that, that'll that could help down the road but right now I don't think the safety case is there for uh, l as we currently understand it <clears throat> this is Stuart sorry to in I just had need to interrupt Stuart go um, just with a procedural thing, um, before these PDFs of the slides, well, they have been posted, um, if they could be updated, uh, I have a request from Apple management to remove Apple's name from the slide that says who plans to deploy SCE. As you know, Apple PR and marketing manage Apple statements very closely, and they object to Apple's name appearing on this. That was not sanctioned by Apple PR. It is not Apple's marketing or engineering position on this statement. So they feel that slide is misrepresentative. So if we can just update the slides, that will avoid that having to escalate. Thank you, Stuart. We can definitely do that because um, we, we had people whose lawyers were unhappy on one or two other names in other places, and we simply removed them. So we, we will update the slides correctly. Thank you. Um, we could talk more or we could try and vote in some way. Do we have any way we can actually take any hums or counts? Martin, can you help in this? Uh, what uh, do we have to find out the consensus? There is no, um, at this time, there's no technical solution for, um, <laughs> for a virtual, virtual hum. Um, uh, that is something that is in work for, uh, for 108, possibly. Um, we all have microphones. <laughs> yes, but, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, there's, there's the list, there's, um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, we could use chat. There's not really a great solution there. I, I would all, I would like to say that, that, I mean, I think there, in terms of characterizing the positions here there there are probably um three things that that i've heard one is there are people who are pretty comfortable now for us as it is and want to move full speed ahead there's another group that thinks it's fundamentally broken and 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 either wants to put it as a dscp which would, which would certainly solve whatever safety issues there are or really not pursue it further and then there's a third group that um has specific data they need to see but wants to continue to work on L4S uh, in that direction. Yeah, Martin, I, I don't mean to, uh, so I, I do want to note that yes, those positions are there, but I think the key here is this, the, the size of the group that has those positions. Yeah, I, by no means am I claiming that it's evenly three ways or anything, but I think there, if we are, Discussing this as a, I think we should be aware of those three positions if we're um, trying to figure out how to structure a vote or consensus call. Can I offer a suggestion? Uh, you have the blue sheet. Why not have an indicator added to your name? It worked pretty well when we tried to uh, enter our names. It's all real time, and uh, we can all just input our own. Uh, or a view there. Yeah, why don't we try it? Um, what is it we're going to ask for? Why don't we try marking the blue sheet with a marker to see whether we crash Etherpad or not? Uh, 
Lindsay. Um, can can we, Melissa, comment first? I think she may have some constructive advice here. Uh, yeah, I was trying to respect the, the Q logic. This is Alyssa Cooper. Um, uh, obviously, total uh, outside observer to this, um, but just want to make a suggestion. Having like three minutes left in a working group meeting is not really enough time to formalize a, a consensus question properly of this nature, even if you guys were in person, I think it would be hard. Um, so I think it would be good to take a little more time, formulate what the question is. I do think, you know, based on uh, Martin's summary, it's kind of a three-part question. Um, and one of the options, uh, in addition to, you know, which of these two protocols do you think should uh, use the code point, uh, would be you need more information. You want to continue gathering more information. So it's not just a binary. Um, and I think that probably makes the etherpad <laughs> voting option uh, off the table as well as the fact that uh, we're having a little bit of um, difficulty with either pad connectivity right now. I'm back channeling with our um, IT people and it's not stable for everyone. So um, I think good structured, clear set of questions to the list uh, where people can evaluate whether, you know, what, what that looks like and also whether any new arguments come up um, in that context would probably be a little safer from the consensus judging perspective than trying to do a quick etherpad vote with two minutes left. Yeah, we have a one minute left and we will talk with our ADs and other wise people about how to take a real sense of this because um, there's, I don't know how many active people, but there's probably 40 or so people regularly commenting on this, uh, which is a reasonably large group apart from those who have um, said that they support it or one way or the other on the list. So we, we need to find those questions and we'll find a way for people to express their the thoughts on them, which oh. helps us build the right answers. Wes, anything to finish with? What it, for what it's worth, people are uh, putting no, stuff in I... on the blue sheet. There are about three or four people in the queue. People. Yeah, we have time for that many people to, do to comment. So, Gina and Bob. Uh, I was going to say, I, I think we're just so about done, and I think Alyssa's suggestion that, that, that we've got to figure out um, what the what the possible positions are or questions are to uh, get consensus and try to get try to get somewhere on the list with a, with. Uh, uh, Mar at least Martin involved, Alyssa, if she's if, if she has the time, time and interest to help out. Wes, you asked, so I'll quickly say in 10 seconds, uh, you can figure out the questions, but please don't make further discussion one of them. That's all I've got. Yeah, and I, I wanted to say that there is no reason to delay too much. So an interim as quickly as possible, please, because there are there are other standards bodies watching this and waiting this and the ITF starting to look embarrassing. I agree, time is very important. And we still have an experiment where we can learn a lot of real deployments. So as long as we are doing experiments in lab trials and trying to find situations or assume situations, we should do the real thing. And that's important uh, to as quickly as possible learn from the experiment. Okay, it's, we are out of time now. job, guys. Thanks yeah, for navigating this difficult conversation. <laughs> done yet. Uh, well, I know I didn't say you were done. I just said you did navigate it. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're not, <laughs> dead. we're not dead yet. <laughs> I still think I think it was a very good conversation. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye. Quarter now. Yeah. Can I just say bye-bye? I'll make whatever comments they want. Bye-bye, everyone.